people who pays attention to Major League Baseball only through the prism of the local franchise, you might not have known who Michael Harris II was before, but you definitely do now. Good morning to you. Good Wednesday morning. I'm Dan Kovacevic of DK Pittsburgh Sports. This is Daily Shot of Pirates. It comes your way bright and early every weekday if you're into football and or hockey. I also offer daily shots of Steelers and Penguins. Same place you found this. Hope you'll check those out as well. Braves 6, Pirates 1 last night at PNC Park. It was nowhere near as entertaining as that score makes it sound. Michael Chavis homered because he was facing a lefty. JT Brubaker gave up six consecutive hits, and that's it. That's it. What else do we want to hear about the game? Oh, yeah. Atlanta's got this really, really terrific kid. Harris is 21 years old. He's a center fielder. He hits for production. He hits for power. He can fly on the base paths. He can defend. He can do everything. He was, all the way back in 2019, a third-round pick in the MLB draft. That's quite a coup there, whether it's the Braves or anybody else. But the fact that it is the Braves, and they're coming off a World Series championship, and they were able to win that championship without Ronald Acuna Jr., and of course Acuna's back. You have this young, fun powerhouse that appears poised to contend in the NL East and thus in the NL for a long time. And they're doing it without that much of a payroll. And let's remember that after winning that championship, that they did lose Freddie Freeman to the billion-dollar Dodgers. But you don't care about that because this is not Daily Shot of Braves. And now you're wondering why you even tuned into this. Well, here's here's why. Here's why. Harris, I'm going to say this again, is 21 years old. Harris was brought up in late May, maybe late enough to avoid Super 2, maybe not. The Braves don't care. The Braves just won a championship. The Braves are contending. He's obviously one of their best players, and they want him in the majors where he can do damage to opponents in the majors, as opposed to in the minors. Kind of makes sense, right? Now, there are some market differences to really, really state the insultingly obvious between the Braves and the Pirates right about now. And you would think that it would be highly likely that if the Pirates ever became contenders again, as they were in 2013-15, to that they too would bring up a player of really high pedigree if he were able to help the team right away, and you wouldn't worry as much about, you know, arbitration and Super 2 and all that other service time stuff. But I've got a way harder question to ask about this scenario today. This portion of Daily Shot of Pirates is brought to you by our friends at North Shore Tavern. That's directly across Federal Street from PNC Park. It's home of Steak on a Stone, an eating experience, underscoring the word experience. The steak is brought to you partially cooked on an 800 degree stone and you do the rest. It's a ton of fun, it's a great meal, and it's a baseball atmosphere like no other in Pittsburgh. North Shore Tavern, right across Federal Street from PNC Park. And that harder question is this. Where is the Pittsburgh version of Michael Harris II from this management team? Now, you can say, well, who gets that lucky to find a talent like this in the third round? Or you can say that some players just advance faster than others. Doesn't mean they're necessarily better players. I am sorry. I'm going to say this again. Harris is 21. He's a center fielder. He's batting 285 with 13 home runs and 43 RBIs. Oh, and by the way, 15 steals in an era where nobody steals, and he's done all that in the span of 279 official at-bats having come up in late May. That's not an accident. That is a player showing significant tools 
we have all taken turns singing the praise of this Pittsburgh management, don't deny it, for their drafts. They've done some pretty neat things. They've added some pretty intriguing options for themselves. And it's going to take time, legit time, fair time, to assess how they've done. However, they've been on the job for three years. They haven't just used the draft as methods of acquisition. They've also executed several trades of several players who have become all-stars or right in that range for their new teams. And as you and I are conversing on this particular morning, the Pirates have one player in Baseball America's top 50 prospects, and that's Termar Johnson, who was just the number four overall pick in the draft and hasn't yet had a chance to participate in anything in the Pittsburgh system. And that brings me to the last point, which is, if Michael Harris, too, had been drafted by the Pirates in 2019, does anyone believe, even for a split second, that A, he'd have been developed properly, or B, that he'd have been developed so well, so efficiently, and with so much poise that he'd be capable of coming into the majors at 21 years old and doing what he's doing. Go ahead, answer that. Do you believe that? Do you believe that this player, had he been drafted by the Pirates in 2019, could have ever been under any circumstance in Pittsburgh this year? Whether he was accelerated or not, I'm just talking about his caliber of play. No? Why is that? Why is... Oh, wait, I know why. Because there's still one rookie in the National League who has more home runs than him. You know who that is? That's right, kids. It's Jack Sawinski. Jack has 14 home runs, one more than Harris does. You know where Jack is? Yeah, you know where Jack is. He's in Indianapolis. And you can debate all you want as to whether or not because he was struggling, he should have gone back down or whatever. How about this for a solution instead? How about that he doesn't go into an 0 for 30 tailspin? Or if he does go into a significant slump, that he's got people who can help him out of it right here, where he had just hit 14 home runs over two months. Whether or not the player was comfortable with the demotion or anything like that, and I've certainly heard plenty of that, is immaterial. What your job is as development or as major league coaches and instructors is to make the players better, not to make them worse. Look at the Braves. When we come back, J1Q. Peter Baxis, who asks, DK, considering the conversation that was once had between the Penguins' former owners and Bob Nutting, can you rehash the outcome of that meeting and the possible steps for revisiting that pipe dream of a Pirates for Sale sign hanging outside 115 Federal? For anybody who doesn't know what could prompt such a question, Arte Marino, the longtime and very wealthy owner, of the Los Angeles Angels of Anaheim, or whatever it is they decided to call themselves this year, has put the Angels up for sale. And you know how that goes in Pittsburgh. Anytime anybody mentions baseball and for sale, the term Bob Nutting trends on Twitter, at least locally. So Peter sent something asking questions about about that situation that goes back, what year was that? Is that 2010? Something like that. Uh, I was at the Post-Gazette at the time, and I broke the story that Mario Lemieux and Ron Burkle, who, as Peter references, were the Penguins' co-owners at the time, had a secret meeting with Nutting. This was at the Penguins' old headquarters at Chatham Center uptown. At this meeting, there was a discussion about whether or not the Pirates would be for sale. Now, there's no way that Nutting 
makes that visit to that office, unbeknownst to his own team president slash CEO, Frank Coonley, I'd find out the next day, without presuming that, hey, maybe these guys want to get into some kind of business, you know, as in buying the team. Because otherwise, there'd really be not much of a reason to keep it secret, and you'd actually want other people in the room with you to discuss particulars, like let's say if it was some shared TV deal or whatever. No, this was going to be exactly what it was. At one point in this meeting, one of Mario or Ron, I believe Ron, slid across the table a check for $300 million. Notting turned it down. At the time, that might have seemed pretty gutsy, but with the Pirates probably being worth a little more than a billion dollars right now, if you base that figure on the recent sale price of the Kansas City Royals in a comparable market, lesser stadium, but better overall baseball operation, at least by some degree, a billion is probably where it'd be. Now, this went nowhere. I couldn't stress that strongly enough at the time, and I can't stress it strongly enough now because I just know the way this city is about this subject and how ecstatic that would have made everybody. But I've got one other thing that I want to throw into this, and it is not exactly the populist tack on this one. Mario and Ron were excellent owners of the Penguins. There's not a negative syllable that can be spoken about their tenure. And I'm not just saying that because of the three championships under their stewardship. They spent up to the cap every single year. They conducted themselves in the franchise in a first-class manner in every way. However, did you catch the word cap in there? Mario and Ron would be the first ones to tell you that it was, in fact, the NHL's cap that allowed the Penguins not just to compete, but to stay in Pittsburgh. And I'm going to remind everyone, and some of you know where this is headed, that before the NHL's cap went into place in 2004, that the Penguins were A, the worst team in the National Hockey League, B, had the lowest attendance in the National Hockey League. C, here it comes, had the lowest payroll in the National Hockey League and sold off all of their good players for some pretty mediocre prospects. Now, I can't know, none of us can, what kind of owners Mario and Ron would have been with the Pirates. But to ever have this discussion without the salary cap being part of that discussion is completely disingenuous. I would love to think and believe that Mario and Ron would have gone over to PNC Park and just snapped their fingers and made everyone a winner, and I would definitely like to believe and do believe that they never would have had the Pirates' payroll as embarrassingly low as it currently is. But if you think that these guys were just going to pull out of their personal wealth and pour it into the team. Not only do you not know how they ran the Penguins before the cap, but you don't know anything about how sports are. No owner does this anywhere. This white horse concept that people have, Mark Cuban will come in and save everything. Cuban would be the last guy to pull money out of his own wallet to fund the team. That's not how it works. There is not one single team in any of the four major professional sports in which the owner spends out of his or her own pocket. Not one. So if Mario and Ron were ever to have turned the Pirates around, it would have been because of their business instincts, their competitive instincts. It would not have been because they would have shown up and just showered everybody with cash. I appreciate the question. I appreciate everyone listening to Daily Shot of Pirates. We'll do another one of these tomorrow.